I'm Camille Charles. I'm director of the Center for Africana Studies. I'm also a professor of sociology, Africana Studies, and Graduate School of Education here at the university. And uh, I would like to thank you all for being here this evening for the last official event of the academic year. Um, and also ask you to please uh, silence your electronic devices as we get started. The Center for Africana Studies, along with the Wharton Sports Business Initiative, welcomes you to our last program of the semester, the Race and Sports Lecture. The annual event, usually scheduled in conjunction with the Penn Relays, was established in 2002 as a forum for informed discussions with prominent athletes, sports scholars, and journalists. This event has offered a forum for a wide range of participants, including Tina Sloan Green, Kellen Winslow, Todd Boyd, Harry Edwards, Stephen A. Smith, Tommy Smith, Marion Jones, Katrina Adams, and most recently, a panel discussion between Preston Brown, John Carlos, Anita DeFrance, and Sonny, and Sonny Vaccaro. Today, we have the great privilege of welcoming back Colin D. Williams, Jr., and Kenneth Shropshire, authors of The Miseducation of the Student Athlete, How to Fix College Sports. This is really special for me because Colin was one of my students. Oh. Yeah. And to call him doctor is the same. But anyway, I feel really old. Dr. Colin D. Williams, Jr. is an educator, author, and researcher addressing issues of race, gender, and socioeconomic status through the lens of sport. His research explores how undergraduate social experiences influence engagement, academic performance, campus climate, and post-college outcomes, especially for students and athletes from low-income, first-generation college and underrepresented minority backgrounds. Colin's work has been featured and quoted in Sports Illustrated, ESPN, Huffington Post, The Washington Post, Time Magazine, and over 300 other national and local media outlets. Since completing his undergraduate and doctoral study at Penn, Cullen worked with the NFL and NBA. He currently serves as Regional Director of Leadership and Education Programs with the Ross Initiative in Sport for Equality. Professor Ken Shropshire is CEO of the Global Sport Institute and the Adidas Distinguished Professor of Global Sport at Arizona State University. He, used, he recently closed out a 30-year career as an endowed full professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, where he was also director of the Wharton Sports Business Initiative, professor of Africana Studies, and academic director of Wharton Sports-focused executive education programs. He now holds the title of Wharton Endowed Professor Emeritus. As an author, his most recent books are Sport Matters, Leadership, Power, and the Quest for Respect in Sports, Negotiate Like the Pros, a top sports negotiator's lessons for making deals, building relationships and getting what you want, and being Sugar Ray, the life of America's greatest boxer and first celebrity athlete. Additional works include the foundational books in black and white, Race and Sports in America, The Business of Sports, and The Business of Sports Agents. His 12th and current book project is The Miseducation of the Student Athlete, a Manifesto to Fix College Sports, and was published in September 2017. Please join me in welcoming Colin and Professor Shachar. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. Um, so I'm Ken Shropshire, the, the old guy. Um, and, and, that, and that's uh, um, an important part of, of the collaboration and, and how it came about. What we're going to, just going to give you a roadmap. I always tell people what you're going to do before you start doing it. So I'm going to kind of give a little bit of an intro on uh, how we came together, what we did. And, and as I was telling a couple of people, Allison and, and others came in earlier, by default, I'm going to talk some about the uh, Condoleezza Rice report that just came out, which is very relevant to, uh, to what, what we're going to talk about today. Um, and, and then Colin will, will, will pick up, kind of fill the gaps that I left, talk specifically about uh, some of the race issues and some more. And most importantly, we, we want to we talk. So we, we really do want to engage with you as early as possible. Uh, having, having done these for, what is this, 15th year? How many times have we done this? I know a lot of folks will want to talk as well rather than ask questions, <laughs> but let us engage in a, in a conversation. Um, but this could be like the Apollo Theater. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
I know, it, especially on this topic. I'm, I, yeah, I know where this can go. And, and I, I want to give you uh, three quotes. This is a good thing about being sort of retired and, and you know, sort of got shut door. You get a chance to sit around and think about this stuff. But three quotes to, to think about as, as we go into this. I mean, you know, the, the, the key issues that, that most of us have on this space that we're about to talk about is who's making the money and is anybody being educated? Right? Those are the, the two pieces that we're talking about. And, and, the, and the Rice Report does something with that that, that I want to talk about. And, and hopefully we did something with those two that, that uh, I think does an even better job than what the Rice Report does, but that's a whole, a whole conversation that we'll get into. Uh, but in the first quote, uh, Bishop, Bishop Desmond Tutu, don't raise your voice, improve your argument. So hopefully we'll provide you with, as you're out there having these conversations, some more ammunition for your argument, um, which I think is, is the right argument about where we should be trying to go with college sports. Um, second, and, and this is where the, the, I think the Rice Report is something we need to think about, is, is, it, are they gonna, is, it, is there gonna be kind of a rapid kind of movement with it that doesn't take us anywhere? And this is, you know, Nelson Mandela has this great quote, not one of the overused one, don't let illusions of urgency force a decision before we are ready. So let, let's not let that, that whole thing let us move too quickly. Um, the third, just think about working with Colin. Uh, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. That's Harry Truman, you know, kind of different kind of character in that. Um, so Colin and I came, came together as um, he was still wandering around here, uh, kind of freshly minute PhD. We had, we had uh, conversed over, over the years. He was here as undergrad and otherwise. Um, and I think I just reached out saying, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about a book. I know that you and Sean have done a lot of research in this space. You know, frankly, I'm thinking about how can I shortcut some of the work I had to do. Um, would you be interested in doing some, I think initially I said some research, right? And uh, to his credit, he, he did not say, no, I want to be a co-author. But as, as we went further along, it became clear. Uh, and, and sort of in my head, I said, you know, maybe this is somebody you should be writing this with. And as, I, as Colin and I were just talking earlier, I, I will tell you it is, uh, I haven't done this a few times, it is, takes just as long to write a book with someone as it does without someone. I mean, there's, there's no, it's a, it's a whole different process uh, to engage with, with someone else in this. Um, and it's always a, a risky kind of proposition too because you never know who, who you're gonna, gonna work with. I, I you know, I, I I'm in the process of kind of halfway cleaning out my office. I'm taking my time. I'll take about five years to do it here. But uh, I found this, this book cover from a book called Basketball Journals that I wrote with Todd Boyd uh, at USC. And some of you, you know, he's Mr. Documentary. You see him all the time. He wouldn't mind me saying this out loud. I would never write another book with Todd Boyd. <laughs> I mean, we're best of friends, but it was a horrible experience in terms of, he, he described it best, and this, this is the era that we wrote it in. He said, well, I think the best way to think about it is, I'm Alan Iverson and you're Tim Duncan. <laughs> that that, that uh, you know, you're gonna be very steady in doing this and I'm gonna jump in whenever I feel like <laughs> it's the right time. And, and whatever the equivalent of practice is, he had that kind of syndrome <laughs> too. Uh, but you know, Colin was, was completely the, the opposite on that. So, so, so let me just, just give you a, a couple things on, on um, what the, the, the Rice Report has in it, kind of kind of where we are with this, and, um, um, and, and then turn it over to Colin for, for a moment. So you know, from our, our piece, one of the things that we talk about is this definition of, of the student athlete. And, and who that person is. Um, and, and there's a, a ruling uh, from the Northwestern unionization case uh, that essentially says this. Uh, in the instant case, it cannot be said the employer scholarship players are primarily students. The players spend 50 to 60 hours per week on their football duties during a one month training camp prior to the start of academic year and an additional 40, 50 hours per week 
uh, during the other three months of football. So, you know, we kind of start off with this court ruling that says, well, these guys, they don't have time to be students, um, so we're not going to call them, call them student athletes. So this kind of whole aura gets established in this space. It's interesting, there and in the Rice Report, we, we think, I'm um, Greg calling in with me on this, in this, in this uh, 60 page document, I don't think race is specifically mentioned once. I mean, this is one of the things that, again, this working with Colin, he said, well, did you, what kind of search did you ask me if I did? I said, did you do a document search for just the word race? Like, did you just hit control find, see if race was in it? I looked at him like, well, yeah, did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I had to have somebody print this thing out. You see, I got the, the paper in here. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the process of doing that search now. Um, so, so to contextualize this, this whole thing, how in the world can you come to a conclusion on what can be done if racism is not a major part of your consideration of how to fix college sports? So I was like, yeah, I'm still, I mean, I'm not going to make the old, you know, I'm not going to make the overall decoration. It may be in there, so, but if it is in there, it's not there in any extensive way. So that, that's, that's the, the first thing. The, the, the second thing, uh, you know, a couple of side, sidebar things that if, if people want to talk about it at length, we'll, we'll talk about it. There are things that have been tried before, and apparently there's not a whole great understanding of history in the report of the kinds of things that, that, that should be done. Um, our, our focus w was the following. I just set up the premise of, of what, what we said. And I mentioned the money being an important piece. There's not a problem with paying athletes and college, student athletes, whatever you want to call them. So we don't have a problem with that overall. And, and this was kind of a, the back and forth conversation of us make sure we agreed on that. Imagine we're going to write this book. We had to make sure we had some kind of basic things that we agreed on. Um, so if, if, if we could get to that, that that's fine. And, and, and the idea of how you would do that is a whole other dramatic kind of conversation. But what we have said, and kind of the big declaration that we're making is, but the number one priority should be to make sure that these men, largely African American men, receive meaningful degrees. That whatever the path is, that's where the abundance of the dollars that became available because all the media rights deals with all the conferences and all the realignment that, that brought all this to bear, that should be the number one priority. And that's one of those things where, you know, it happens to be uh, this predominance of African American men, but it benefits everybody because there's a lot of people not getting their degrees as a result of, of this process. Um, uh, black, white, men, women, and otherwise. So shouldn't that be what this enterprise is, is fully focused upon? The, the Rice Report does have a, a section that references this, but it doesn't provide any guidance on, on how that would be done. But it does say, what's very important to the three things we said, it does say that there should be an allocation of a uh, substantial amount of funding to work to, uh, they say, a degree completion. So, and, and an important piece that we, we hover on is the idea of meaningful degree completion, because the idea Built into the system, and, and part of what we talk in the book, built into the, into the system, there are rewards to coaches and athletic directors for athletes to <coughs> graduate. Doesn't matter what you graduate in, doesn't matter if it's a degree you can be successful in life with, uh, but, you, you, but so, so the incentive to, to steer somebody to just get it done is there as opposed to how do you do something, something meaningful. So. Uh, that kind of kind of tees up the the basics of, of what um, we were were beginning to look at. The, the one last thing that I want to say, and I just wrote about this yesterday, um, just so you don't think I'm I'm crazy when I uh, read this report. I think it was about 20, 25 years ago. I was the faculty athletics representative from the University of Pennsylvania, the athletic powerhouse, to to the NCAA, and. Um, this was right after a couple of agents, uh, Norby Walters and Lloyd Bloom. There was another, there was a previous scandal that, that, that caused 
um, the NCAA to say, hey, we need to form, and it really, it really was one, you can Google this, we need to form a basketball issues committee. So I was on this, it may have been one before that, so I was on the last basketball issues committee. And uh, just by circumstance or whatever else, I was put on a subcommittee, which, you know, all these things, please record everything in your life because you, you never know who you were with and you look back on it and say, boy, I should have done more with this. I was on a subcommittee with uh, Dean Smith, uh, Terry Holland, when he's coaching at, at uh, Virginia, and CM Newton, who's a, who was one of the great Kentucky kind of athletes. So I was on, and the subcommittee, the task was to determine whether or not we should pay athletes. And then some, some, and, and, and some, you know, I, somewhat, I was, Dean Smith wasn't all, the other guys I didn't really know. Terry Holland had coached Ralph Sampson, so, so these guys were all, and I was kind of this uh, relatively new in, in this business. The conversations we had then were the following, which, which, which uh, hold true now. And, and the thought there was to pay these guys about $30,000 a year. I don't, you know, convert that to today's dollars, I have no idea what, what that would be. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a great amount. It might be like, you know, $100,000 today or, you know, 80000 or something like that. Um, and Dean Smith said, not with us anymore, so you know what to follow up on this. But Dean Smith said, um, you know what? It doesn't make any sense because $30,000 will have no impact on anybody's life that's about to get somewhere. Either they can go play pro and get paid a lot more, or they can get paid by some of these other characters that are here and be, be satisfied. So the idea that we think we're accomplishing anything by paying any money is, is not a real thing. And we, and we kind of left it at that. And there, at the time, there wasn't even a discussion about why are these men, and we were talking about men at the time, why are they in school and what should we do? Uh, what should we be doing with these, these men's time at, at this, this moment in time? So in, in some ways, and, and that, I don't know, you know, I don't remember what the big outcome of that re report was and what the conclusion was. And I think, uh, sadly, that's going to be the same thing with, with this report, too, is 25 years from now, somebody will look back and say, I, you know, I don't really remember what, what they came up with. As, as I read this, and you've heard a lot of people say some version of this, uh, I kept looking 60 pages. I kept looking for the 61st page to to really convey something. Even even if the 61st page was the one where we finally had. Oh, and by the way, race is a big part of this too. But it, it, it didn't provide uh, much of anything. So so I guess I'm concluding what I think of, think about it now. So I'm saying it out loud. Um, so I'm gonna turn over to, for, to Colin for for a moment to to talk about. Um, Specifically, the, the, the race issue that's not talked about here, and and to uh, talk about in, in our book how we uh, incorporated that into our thinking of, of what should be done, and, and then to, to talk about some of the specifics that we talked about in terms of, of the remedies that should come about. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to start off by by sharing a story with you. Uh, the year was. 2008, I was a sophomore here at the University of Pennsylvania. It was the summer after my sophomore year, and I had the opportunity to intern at ESPN. Uh, there was a tournament called the Elite 24 tournament that brought together the 24 best high school players and uh, in be 24 best high school basketball players that weren't seniors, so the inverse of the McDonald's All-American. Um, working that tournament, I worked with these really good high school players, and one day, a guy who's currently in the NBA asked me, hey man, how do you spell team? The next day, another guy asked me, how do you spell squad? These were words that aren't separate from the sphere of basketball. Team and squad are pretty standard words that you should be able to spell. And that for me was the first time that I recognized that there was something drastically different between the experiences that these athletes who were granted an opportunity to go to college for sport and how different that was from the opportunity that I was granted to go to college for and what that would look like. So I, being first generation American, first generation college, always looked at college as a space, as an opportunity. How do you advance yourself from whatever situation you come from to go to the next one? And I recognized that 
these men who, or boys at the time, that I had looked at at folks with this immense opportunity, I had for the first time seen a part of their story that I was not aware of, and that I sort of became cognizant that maybe much of America was not aware of. Um, so it was a story that I had really wanted to tell, um, but hadn't really found the, uh, the right space in which to do so. Fast forward a couple years, I get connected with a professor here at Dr. Sean Harper, who's now at uh, USC, and he calls me one day, he's like, Colin, you care about this sports stuff. He says, I just saw this commercial, uh, 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 and it said that student athletes are performing at higher rates than their non-sport peers, right? So if you play sports in college, you're graduating at a higher rate than your peers are. And he was like, what are your thoughts on that? And I was like, not for black men. Just sort of immediately, without doing any research, not looking into it. Um, and he was like, that, that was my thinking initially. Let, let, let's discover this. Let's, let's search around and, and find what's going on there. So uh, that year, I end up missing all Thanksgiving break, because I'm there crunching numbers trying to get this report together for Sean. And we also, Ken writes the forward to that study. But we do this research to find out if this is true. Are student athletes actually graduating at rates higher than their non-sport peers? being that degree completion is the major way to assess whether or not uh, folks are fulfilling the mission of higher education, right? What we found, um, not really surprising, but the numbers were, on average, black male athletes represented 2.5% of the, the campus that they were a part of, but on football teams and on basketball teams, they were somewhere between 55 and 60% of the teams, right? So the notion essentially being, the black men that we allow on our campus, for the most part, are going to be athletes. So insert race, sort of step one there. Uh, then we also looked at the graduation rates comparatively. So we looked at black male student athletes as the group that we were focused on, and then compared them to the other subsets, right? So black male undergraduates overall, student athletes overall, as well as uh, black males overall, student athletes overall, and one other control group. But we, and when we compared them across all three, not surprising to us, black male student athletes were graduating at lower rates than all of their peers um, that, that should have some sort of comparable graduation rate. So we then said, how do we present this information, right? And Sean, being a scholar around black male success within higher education, has always been a fan of the anti-deficit framing. We hear so much about the doom and gloom, about how much black men aren't graduating, Let's look at the guys that are doing well and, and sort of put that, that narrative out there. Unfortunately, uh, I said, Sean, I don't think this is the time to do that. I said, in this case, I think we need to let people see that which house is on fire so we can focus on that house, right? Um, so one question just a couple weeks ago, I was on a panel uh, that Ken invited me to in uh, DC, and someone stood up and said, why race? Why are we continuing to narrow this conversation and focus on race specifically? Um, and one response that I've heard recently, um, it's sort of analogous, is right now when we talk about Black Lives Matter, how come some people say all lives matter? Why are we saying all lives matter? And someone said, if there's a row of houses and one of those houses is on fire and someone calls the, the fire department and they come, they don't start putting water on all the houses because all those houses matter, right? They, they treat and address the one that's on fire because that is the one that's in dire need. When we look at the outcomes of college sport, things are pretty good in college sport overall. Like, and, and that's what folks aren't recognizing, right, is that when you look at student athletes, student athletes, in fact, overall, they do have better outcomes. Um, they have better life outcomes. They have better satisfaction. They're happier. They're healthier. Uh, they make as much money or, uh, as, as their peers do. So for that population, student athletes, they are in a good position. However, when we focus on the house that's on fire, we have to look at division one, we have to look at men's basketball and men's football, where most of the money that we see in the enterprise of college sports is being generated, right? Um, not to say that they're better than non-revenue generating athletes, but they have some c contribution to the resources that are being generated and they should be, have some access to that contributing to their academic experiences. So we are now looking at these black men within Division I that are playing football and basketball, and how are their experiences differing from the, their peers? And when it comes down to it, it's that they have an a, entirely different story, an entirely different sort of socialization into college sport that really affects and impacts the way that they view school, 
the way in which that they, they prioritize academics over athletics, if that ever happens, um, and the way that they see it, right? Um, and I think I, I did my dissertation study. I spoke to 40 men across the Power Five conferences, so 28 different institutions, and uh, they had the same theme of time being the biggest issue. Time, there's not enough time to be a student and an athlete, uh, considering that they have 40 to 50 hours of practice. However, the interesting thing, the folks that I spoke to uh, for my dissertation that are, who share their perspectives here are really successful student athletes, right? Um, and if you think about it, participation bias is a part of that. I cold emailed 1,200 athletes that were seniors, and the ones that responded are ones that are a little bit more academic. Um, in fact, there were 20 walk-on athletes of my sample of 40, and amongst them, I think the average GPA was like 3.7, right? So when we look at, oh, the average GPA, it's like, well, it's really strong for a certain subset of men. The other interesting part is I'm writing a book or doing a dissertation about this race thing, and most of my respondents are white. I'm hearing from white college athletes that are walk-ons. Um, it definitely shifted the way I continued to write the dissertation, but it was also very telling, right? And even them, hearing from their perspective, they were very much aware of how their experience differed from those of their teammates, the ones who I originally was trying to reach out to, to hear what it was like being a black athlete. And, the, and John, the first pseudonym that we use in the book, right, uh, he talks about coming from a family where sport wasn't a way out of a situation. It wasn't about this great opportunity to escape from something, but it was just a thing that he loved, something that was passed down to his family, and a tradition he wanted to continue. Walking on, you don't get accepted by any special ad admission criteria, right? You do what the standard college student does. You visit schools. You figure out how you're going to pay for it, and you make your way there, as opposed to students that have folks coming to living rooms, um, talking to their moms and talking to their families and saying, hey, we want you to come to that school, right? So the socialization is different there. Then you have this understanding that school and sport is not something that's guaranteed. Walk-ons by, by, by nature haven't always been the man, right? They are not the person that's like, oh, you have this given to you. So they're working their butts off because they have to do school because it's not covered, and they do sport. And hearing sort of that dichotomy of what was going on, they were very well aware that this was not the case for their peers, right? Because they now have the, the what I was trying to put into dissertation, they had that experience firsthand. They lived throughout the school year with these men that were from these varying situations saying, my buddies don't have money to send home for their families that are going through these things. Their families can't come visit them. They don't have support. Um, and then when they get into classrooms, assumptions are made about them, right? A walk-on student is a, is a student who is not necessarily known as an athlete, but they get into a classroom and the people that hold them most intense stereotypes around a lot of athletes are professors because they value education, they take it seriously, and it's hard for them to sort of recognize someone else who they feel is a part of that space, not in that same way. Um, but I say all this to say that for this report to not really bring race into the forefront and to be talking about college basketball, right? College basketball um, is largely irresponsible. Um, I think race has to remain a prominent part of this conversation. Um, we have to consider the factors that go into it, look at the sociology, sociology of it, because the differences that exist between the high achieving student athletes and the ones that aren't making the most of their opportunity, a lot of that comes down, comes to, comes down to their socialization, which is heavily affected by their racial background. So I, I mentioned uh, the, the time that it takes to be, be engaged in college sport, and, and Colin did as well. And I mentioned the Northwestern uh, case and the, the numbers that are 40, 50 hours a week. And part of it, I say this in the, in the book, and, and part of the real, realization that I, I came to, my son at the time that we were writing this was finishing up playing uh, college tennis. And, and he was you know, kind of consistently talking about how he didn't have time to do this or, or that. And I, and I finally, and I, and I, I played football in college. I, I, I made everything work. So I'm like, well, why can't you, know, what, what's, wrong with, what's wrong with you? I mean, I was really in a place where I didn't understand how different things had become. For anybody that's kind of in the you know, time warp that I was in, 
how different things had really become in terms of what you can really do and what kind of time you had to do the things you want. Even at a school, you know, Northwestern Penn, wherever you are, it's just, it's, it's just not the same. So once I really got my arms around that, it, it did become more of a puzzle to figure out, well, how do you do it? And it did become more of a puzzle. You know, the, 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 the key thing to think about, for, for anybody that's thinking, well, you know, some, most of these guys are going to be pro anyway, or many are going to be pro anyway, it really is that 98% that, that aren't. That, that really is true. So, so really, you need to be thinking more about the masses as opposed to those exceptions that do go on to be professional. So, so what, you know, what, what do we do to change that? So part of what, what we tried to, to come up with was um, a manifesto to think about what kinds of changes would you make to accomplish this? So, so the first thing, again, the, I give the Rice Report credit for this, you need, a lot, you need a lot of money channeled in that direction to do this. Um, but the kinds of things that, that we, we talked about, and I'll kind of, kind of go through, through a few of them, uh, were uh, a boot camp, uh, an academic boot camp, both at the beginning and the end of the athlete's career. That as you come in, and there need to be touch points along the way, because the other problem with this, if you're going to be a successful athlete, you're not going to believe you're going to be in the 98%. So the idea that it's acceptable in some way to be thinking about what your future will be. I mean, I've done a lot of work with, with NFL players, and those guys, when, when they're in the league, and they were the, you know, the, the 220th draft pick, they still think they're going to be in the league for 15 years. <coughs> And they, you know, the most successful guys, don't think about what am I going to do next. So, so it's, it's something that's, that's endemic in, in, in the whole, uh, whole sports setting. So, so, th so that kind of work. In, in the first boot camp, the conversation may well be something like, uh, you know, I always wanted to be a doctor. And that's one of the, the key plaintiffs in the Northwestern case, uh, Kane Coulter, wanted to be a physician. He got there, found out he couldn't take classes in the afternoon. And you know, part of the reason he was irritated and, and led the unionization effort was because he, he looked around and said, I'm not doing what I really wanted to do. Part of what can be done to, to remedy that, that is, and it's happening in some places, lifetime scholarships where you actually map out how you can accomplish that. I mean, maybe you are, and you know, more and more people are going to think, I'm going to school for five or six years anyway. If you want to have this, uh, this great athletic moment in your life in college, but you also want to be something that takes something more than, than that you can't fit into classes that occur between six and ten in the uh, after six and ten six to ten in the morning, and then before one thirty in the afternoon. I mean, the ten to one thirty kind of one. If your classes don't fall in there, then you can't major in that, and and that window might be too too large. Um, but maybe you can map your life out where. I'm going to do this for my four years of eligibility, five years, whatever it be, and then I'll be able to go back and do the things that I want to do. And that's being paid for. But if I go to the league, whatever the league might be, maybe I can come back later if I still have the motivation because there's money in place to allow me to do that. Just a quick, quick uh, uh, comment on, on that. You talked about this a, a number of times. I can't tell you the number of athletes, you know, prominent guys that have said, yeah, yeah, that's for tuition. What about room and board? I mean, which, you know, I, that, that's, that's fine, too. I mean, that's something to think about. because they, they just start to push me to the point where, no, you need, you need everything. I mean, the school's going to be paid for it. If you've played pro for five, six years, maybe you have some money set aside to do <laughs> something for yourself. Uh, but, but those are the kinds of conversations um, uh, um, to, to engage in. Uh, but, but, the, but the idea of, of setting up the, the framework to do that, one of the things that, that, that Colin uh, brought up, and you know, we kind of know who wrote what part of the book or came up with the ideas, it is, and I think it's important we all think about this, is I'm talking about as you're coming in, but more needs to be done even before they get, get to, to the institutions. We, so we, we talk about that as well and address some of those things. So why don't you talk some about the... You know, prep for prep, just, just, just a little bit about how, how that fits in, how that potentially could fit in. And again, think about you know, what we're talking about. There's a lot of money. So you know, all these ideas are, are, are completely feasible. 
Uh, <clears throat> so I am a product of a program called Prep for Prep. It's a New York based program and it identifies highly talented uh, lower schoolers, fifth graders, and it places them, takes them from public schools and places them in independent schools that are in need for diversity, uh, but those students also are in need for academic environments that are rigor enough, rigorous enough to sort of push them to their limits, right? And prep for prep, it meets you as this fifth grader, says you have this talent, you have this ability, um, that it spends two summers, uh, the summer after fifth grade and the summer uh, after sixth grade, as well as the school year in between giving you academic enrichment. So you spend this 14 month period of getting prepared before you actually go to this new environment that you're gonna be a part of. But when you think about this program based, upon, based in New York, there's some sociological aspects that you have to think about as well, right? So low income minority students that are high achieving, a lot of black, Latino and Asian kids being placed into the Andovers and Exeters, the Collegiates, the Brearleys. So not only do they have to be academically prepared, but they also have to be prepared for the social emotional changes, right? How do they go from being the really smart kid in this environment to being the super minority kid in this environment, right? So like it's, 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 a, it's a culture shock. Um, and prep, th accounting for that, it sort of starts by saying, hey, we're gonna get you so ready for school that school will be easy, so you only have to think about the school part of it because the cultural adjustment is so important, right? Um, so that, that's step one. Then when you get to the school, you also then have meetings with counselors um, on weekends to just check in and see how, how is it going. Are there any issues, things that you're going through, right? Um, so they check in with you there. Then as you become, you get into high school, there's a leadership development piece where you have these meetings that help you think about how can you now, after acclimating well, become a leader within that environment, and then as you get a little bit older, it, when you get ready for the college process, there's a college preparatory component where it prep literally takes all the kids from all the schools that it sent, that it sent to these various schools and sends them now to college campuses to visit these campuses, to see what it's like, to talk and interface with admissions officers, to get a sense of what college life is going to be, right? And I, and I, I reference prep for prep and I talk about the story because it shows you what a holistic program can do and how it thinks about them um, and not, not only did it do that in terms of the college process, by the time I was applying to Penn, my guidance counselor said to me that I could barely get into Chapel Hill at UNC. And I said, interesting, I spoke to the person at Chapel Hill, he told me I was a great candidate. And in fact, I stopped going to my guidance counselor and reached into the things that, the, to these tools that I had learned to apply to Penn early, to get in, come here, and you know, actualize the dreams that I had for myself, right? And this program, for me has then created this, um, maybe delusional, right, but has created this expectation that excuses aren't an option, right? And especially in an enterprise where there's so much money, we can do all this work. The other thing about Prep for Prep was that it's a nonprofit. There isn't a billion dollar funder behind it who's providing these funds. It's really making it work based upon the identifying needs that exist. So what does this have to do with the college sport thing, right? It's like if we are dedicated to improving the outcomes for this group of, of, of this population of students. And to be clear, not a very large population of students because this is around 65, 70 teams that we're talking, 65, 70 institutions that we're talking about, that a lot more can be done. We can intervene earlier in the process and then we can also intervene when the process is technically over, right? So I mentioned the ESPN internship earlier. That ESPN internship was also through my connection at Prep for Prep even after I had been in college and said, hey, here's an opportunity. When I spoke to the 40 men that I, that I talked to, their biggest issue when it talks about preparation, like what's next after sport, was that they had not had an opportunity to, although the desire is greatly there, to experience a workplace. They didn't know what an internship looked like, how you would apply for one. They had no resumes. These things were completely foreign to them, right? All these things that I had through Prep for Prep, the opportunity to do as a 13 year old, right? And it's how do we get these things in front of these men prior to doing that? Um, and at the same time, recognizing that maybe we can't fix college sports, right? That, that's a heavy endeavor, right? Um, but what are the things that we can do to mitigate some of these things? Um, and, and, and one thing that comes to mind is even just a professional boot camp after they're done with their sport career to say, here are a couple of weeks, months, whatever that time frame may be, 
to get this opportunity that sport has stripped you of because that was a sacrifice that you cannot gain from it, right? Um, I say all that to say that there's so many ways that these issues can be addressed. Um, and the fact that we still try to put out reports um, that don't really assess race and don't bring certain pieces into it, we're, we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Like transparency has to be the beginning of the conversation. We have to say what the problems are and why they exist. And then we actually have to do something about them. And, and, and I, I don't know. This is a, uh, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. I add, add one more layer on, on, on that and then we'll open it up for, for questions and kind of delve into some more of, of uh, what our, our thoughts are about this. But, but in, in this, uh, in the Rice Report, there is, uh, <laughs> there's a planned takeover of a, AAU basketball. That, that, that the way we're going to clean this whole thing up is for the NCAA, because they, you know, NCAA, the one thing NCAA does well is, is run championship tournaments. Um, so I'm not, so it's, you know, so it's, there's something conceptually that's, that's possible there, but, but you know, one thing the NCAA doesn't have recognition of is you, you're taking on too much. You, you, you know, you got, you got enough going on. So we're going to take over AAU basketball. And they, and, they, and they say, essentially for, as Collins kind of allude, allude to, it's maybe 3,500 kids that are identified in any given time as being in line to be, reach the top of the, of the pyramid. So it's, not, so it's not a large number. So, so if you think this idea of creating a special prep program that you have to do to be in this youth basketball thing, it's not, it's not so far-fetched. But that's not something that's discussed in here. And football's the same, it's becoming the same way. I mean, you can certainly identify the high schools, but as it becomes more of a seven-on-seven -seven kind of thing, it is not difficult to think about incorporating this boot camp prep piece into what we do with sport in a way that's different. I mean, that would be you know, the most consistent. I didn't do a, an appropriate search on Twitter. To figure out. It's probably some tool you can do this. But, but the thing that I was seeing most often was people saying this, this didn't go far enough, that, that, uh, that it was like a, you know, what, a nothing burger. It was nothing, you know, so what? What, is, what, what, is, what, is it, what does this do? But something like that, I mean, that's what I think would be the, the whole new day if you say, you know what, most of these kids aren't going to make it anyway, so we know the horse is out the barn in terms of the hours people will spend. You can't, it's really hard to, to try to limit practice any more than you do. All that stuff is very difficult to do, but the idea that if you're in this elite class, you're going to have to do this stuff uh, in order to succeed. And, and the funnel out, which, which they've uh, kind of got their arms around and become to understand, the funnel out for anybody is, Go see if you can be a pro. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, part of what's going to happen is there's going to be a whole new uh, path to try to think about somebody that's been misidentified, and and they get cast out there in this pro space, and they're out there floating in space on, on their own. But the system's pretty good across the leagues, and it's pretty difficult to say I'm going to declare myself for the draft. And nobody's told you that's where where you should be. It's it's it, you know, it's more and more difficult across sport to do that. So so it's not likely that that's gonna gonna happen. And, and you know, as I'm shocked to 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 see the conclusion by Condoleezza Rice and, and the crew that uh, okay, we finally accept that if somebody can be a multimillionaire coming out of high school, we're not going to stop them from doing that. I mean, that's I don't I don't think. You know, is, is, uh, I've, I've said this before in this room, you know, Harry Edwards, uh, the great sociologist, once said, if my kid didn't take the millions of dollars coming out of high school, then he's not smart enough to go to college. I mean, so, so really is not, there's not much of a, a decision to be made there. I mean, I'm not really surprised, because the layers of exploitation, right, are pretty, I mean, they're pretty thick. So I actually used NCAA data from my master's paper. They collected all of these data um, that I don't think ever saw the light of day in terms of you know press kinds of publicly available reports and those kinds of things. And so if you figure they're actually banking on the fact that black kids and their parents 
are so disproportionately likely to see sport as the way out, right? And so academically, I mean, because this was back when we were arguing over the minimum SAT score to be eligible, right? And so I think there's a, there's a subset of kids for whom something like this would work, but the problem is that they have abandoned in any serious way the academic piece, and, and not even voluntarily, right? Coaches in Pop Warner and in middle school and in high school, so that in some ways, I actually think they should get paid and get room and board if they want it. Because first of all, most of those guys, if they go pro, are making league minimum. And as you said, they're blowing their money. Um, and they were recruited to college to get an education in exchange for their athletic ability. But they're, if they're not academically able to cash that check, and they don't have the time, because you know, a, to a 14 month program ahead of college probably isn't good, depending on the school that they're in, then, I mean, it just seems to me that it's the least they could do um, in, those, in those instances for those big D1 schools. But it doesn't surprise me that they wouldn't, even if the conversations were had in private, that it wouldn't make it into that report because the layers of that exploitation, like you just keep peeling it back and peeling it back. Um, so that admitting that, and, and the race piece then becomes much more obvious, it seems to me. So maybe you all now push that piece of it because it is in the public domain and I don't think you can expect the NCAA to want to go there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's it's still to me it's still in, in the digestive phase. I said I got to read this. I still haven't, you know, had the you know kind of black coffee rate readers thing in, in, in great depth to really uh, really understand it. But you know, the the thing that I'll throw out this kind of a, a, a tangential piece, but something you were saying about uh, black families and this you didn't say this exactly, but you know, this is the opportunity. There's still a lot of pressure that if you're a great at sport, you're gonna make that money so you'll be be okay. It's you know not an issue we're talking about here, but so the numbers of and I don't have them in front of me, the numbers of, of white guys playing NCAA football is declining while black kids is is increasing. And it's a measurable kind of kind of number. And you know I, I I am sure this is all related to CTE and concussions and all that sort of stuff where um, and I don't know what all the elements are about why we are not as on top of saying, don't play this game anymore mm -hmm. as, as some others are. Um, if, it's, if it's the opportunity overriding, I don't think it's the information piece of it. I think it is, yeah. is the, this is an opportunity. You know, you know boxing, you know, same what you kind of look at the different groups that are mm -hmm. in, in boxing over the years and who's still in there. So in my, uh, in, in my time working with professional athletes, um, one thing that I often hear, particularly from football players, is, oh no, I play football. My kids can't play football. Like, not an option. Not, not even a thought. They can play soccer. They can play lacrosse. Even that's a little, little bit physical. But for a lot of the, the men on football teams, they recognize the sacrifice, the limited opportunities, but again, saw this as the only viable pathway. Um, so even if it's dangerous, even if concussions become a part of it, even if you're missing out on an education, if they only see this one narrative of folks that look like them that are successful, either made it through basketball, football, acting, or, or entertaining, right? Like that's what they're going to pursue. Um, and, and I think that's why the race part of it has to be more prominent in the discussion because not everyone has been systematically marginalized and kept out and not given access to higher education and other opportunities to advance themselves. Um, and for that reason alone, it becomes this thing where it's like, we have to. It's like, I have to do this, although I recognize my chance of getting slimmer, people are getting faster than me, I'm still putting all my eggs in this basket because the folks that do make it are the ones that sort of never give up and never yield to that dream of achieving that. 
Colin, a question specifically for you. I love your description about the early intervention program that you described in New York, and I think it was great. It obviously worked for you. But when I think about the amount of money that's involved, particularly at the football level, Division I, and in basketball, it seems to me that there is no real incentive for those schools or the NCAA to make sure that these students, particularly black men, get an education, and then you factor in the incentives that are in place for the college coaches and the pressure on women. Where is the pressure going to come from to make sure that they do get an education? That's a great question. Um, if I had the answer, <laughs> uh, one thing that Ken and I talked about was is it viable to use incentives for graduation rates, right, for degree completion for coaches, right? Um, and the immediate thought that we had was no. Like, as we've seen from a number of the scandals and the academic fraud that's going on and from the highest academic institutions to the ones that aren't regarded in the same way, these issues are consistent, right? Like, there's too much money, too much at stake to really care about the school part of it. And that's why in my own thinking that I'm starting to lean towards maybe this, is, this intervention is something that comes once that realization that sport is no longer an option, maybe that's where it starts, right? Um, because prior to that, it's really hard to separate anybody within the enterprise away, away from that goal because it's too potentially lucrative for the, the student athlete and it's actually lucrative for the coaches that are in that system. Um, and you have coaches that do care, um, but those coaches are a few and far between, right? You got jo John Thompson at, at Georgetown. Uh, we had Coach Jerome Allen, who, who was here at Penn, like really cared, but those things aren't, aren't the norm. And it's, not, it's just not a part of the structure that it has to be. Hey, you wonder if, it, if it's, you know, so you got, you got a SWAT team. For, okay, this guy's not going to make it. Send the SWAT team. To tell, you give them, show them the mirror, bring all the, the stories. Uh, and, and then you've had this this prep thing in advance. I mean, there's so many pieces you could add to what's out there. And in, in the end, you're right. I mean, you're not going to get everybody. I mean, no, no matter what we do, you won't get everybody. But there's, but right now, there's there is no safety net. It's a very small net right now. I am uh, proud to say that I'm part of the 98. percent um, I played basketball here in the city at St. Joe's. Um, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I was lucky enough to have parents who um, were focused on education. My mother was an educator, um, lifelong, and um, you know, coming to St. Joe's from Missouri, it, it was kind of a culture shock to me. Um, but one thing that 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 was um, was ingrained in me was my education had to come first before I went into uh, sports, and that was before I even left high school. So. Um, to come to school and be able to, you know, have a good experience in, in a culture that was not black, all white, almost uh, at St. Joe's, and still be able to flourish, it started early. So, and I like what you're on to. Starting early is is really the key. And if we get kids to understand that um, they're going to school to not have a school take advantage of them, but we need to go to school to, to take advantage of the universities and you know, do what we have to do in the classroom so we can come out on top and, instead of on the bottom and fighting to get back to the top when, when we're out. Um, you know, that's really the key. And if, if we don't start at those <coughs> ages where they're 13, 14, and let them know, hey, you can play sports, sure, but if you don't focus on you know, the age of 22, 23, when you're done and what you're going to do after you don't make it to the league or whatever pro league that, that, that you want to go to, um, it, it, it will continue to be the same cycle. Um, and, and, and I'll be interested to talk with you guys about, you know, um, seeing what you can do at those like grassroots levels, so to speak, to make sure we touch those kids at those ages. Yeah, you know, again, it, it is interesting to think about. That what the NSA is talking about is taking on this whole major challenge of taking over all of basketball at the grassroots level. So this is a moment where somebody's going to try to do that. They're going to try to do something different in this space. I'm not, I, I don't think they were specific about what age they were going to kind of start at, but to incorporate these things in there, you know, it, it's, it's no more difficult than what we're talking about doing anyway, to, to have the academic piece be a part of, of what has to be done. So um, 
how to do it, I, I, I don't know, but I think the, the, the funds to try and do it are, are there. Sorry. One thing I always think about is the view is myopic in the sense that people focus on the NCAA or focus on college only, but what's going on with the NCAA is indicative of issues with America, the American education system in general. It's not that these kids are getting to college and even if these colleges were prepared to properly educate them or incentivized to properly educate them, they get in there on a the sixth grade reading level. So that doesn't start in high school, it doesn't start in college, it starts growing up in the lower school and then you accept, like, the fact that they're all athletes exasperates their poor education because not only are they coming from these desperate situations, but kids nowadays get identified at eight years old, nine years old as the next big thing or they gonna be somebody's uh, calling card to the next future or like people can latch onto them when they're kids. So, got a 10 year old, the people thinking, oh, I want him to be really good, or middle school basketball, or whatever, they're not worried about education from Jump Street. So, we worried about college, but we gotta start systemic with the American education system at the bottom because where these kids are coming from, they're not getting anything in those communities. So, whether they're prepared or not at college, doesn't matter. So, it's really both. I think we've got to take a view at you know, youth basketball and AAU as well as college basketball, and then just like where they're coming from in general. Um, my general sentiment on the NCAA now and just football in general and kind of the NFL and you know pulling guys off the field, guys who look like me and you. Um, part of me wants, in my heart I want to say, you know, black men shouldn't be on the football field or why aren't the, the, the rates dropping, but <coughs> even look at youth participation rates in Pop Warner now, as I go down to Florida every year to watch championships, it's getting blacker and blacker and blacker. Like those middle class families, those middle class people, that declining is only coming from a certain demographic of people. And it's because when you only have your options are, you know, entertainer, you know, a, a comedian or actor, whatever, an athlete, or one or the other. Of course, that's why our leagues look so black as they do now, because we only have so many options. So I look at the kind of broad view and say, well, I want to say, you know, get off the field, don't play, don't play. But what else are they going to do? Because of the early point about the American education system, if you don't have access to resources to have multiple options, if your only options are limited to football and basketball, and then if you do rise to prominence in football, you can become a beacon of hope in your community. You can become an educator. You can become that person that says, my family doesn't have to play football anymore. I can, it stops with me, right? So you get to that point where you've, now you have the social capital to create a great impact and you're doing a lot and you're hyper visible as a football player. So, I mean, I want to say, you know, safety first, you know, we've got to protect our minds and our brains, but you know, what else are young black men going to do if they don't have those figures to look up to, those figures to, to want to be in, the motivation to get there? So I want them off the field, but at the same time, it's like we got to fix some of the systemic issues with this country so that they have options to do other things and have access to other things. And I mean, one thing I talked about with Jared, I know it here. Um, we have a question. Oh, sorry. I know. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just one thing. I'm sorry. It's just we're, yeah. we're limited in my, my, time. My bad, my bad. I'm sorry. I know. I just want to have one thing to but it's about letting people know that there's other jobs outside of like just being a football player, a basketball player, and that you can do a multitude of things related to sports. So, my Okay. Um, just tagging on to your, um, when you mentioned the coaches, I was the coach, college coach for 15 years. Um, so just wondering, I know what I put into to my players, you know, and whether knowing where they came from or what they were about to get into, but what have you seen that the coaches are doing or the administrators are doing and how they are taking race into consideration? Uh, I think, <laughs> so <laughs> to be fair, I have limited exposure to college coaches. Um, I, most of my exposure to college coaches comes from the work that I do now with the Ross Initiative and Sports for Equality. Um, and I travel to a bunch of universities on a weekly basis to engage student athletes about how they can be champions of diversity on their campuses regarding issues of race. Um, and those coaches in those spaces, because they're self-selecting into it, are the ones that are conscientious of it. They're the ones that are saying, I don't really know much about it so much. Can you help me understand? Um, but from the other side, I, I, I can speak about how the students talk, the student athletes talk about their experiences. And they've said either, there's a particular coach that may be a positional or running back coach, maybe a person of color who will actually take those things into account. Um, but on the, for the other side of it, it's like, 
identity is left out of the conversation, right? Um, so I, this year with the Patriots, with the Eagles, with a bunch of different teams, go in and talk to the rookies around what, how have they thought about identity, right? And not necessarily about the academic identity, but all sorts of the identity, color, location, geographic, all that stuff. And for a lot of those rookies, they say to me, Colin, this is the first time someone's asked me about me, not as a football player, right? And this is when they've made it to the NFL. Um, so I think that that's telling in and of itself around the identity piece that folks aren't really engaging them in that piece because as you mentioned, eight years old, nine years old, now you're going viral because you can touch the rim. It's like, no, no one's gonna ask you about anything else besides basketball. We have time for just one more very short question. <laughs> oh, sorry, just uh, when you said on fun, this might help. Oh, no, no. So talking about funds, uh, I love the conversation about uh, educating the student athlete. But when you look at the, uh, so I was a former auditor, um, and when you look at the financials, right? Last year, um, in 2016, uh, the NCAA did a one-time distribution for 200 million to only Division One schools for student welfare, right? And so it's been two years since that one-time 200 million distri distribution, and there's the, the conversation is still centered around how do we go after the 180. Division One basketball players that will enter in to the collegiate uh, athletics, you know, each year. Um, so, has there been any discussions? I know you guys released the book in November, but outside of just educating the student athletes, making sure the funds are available um, for that down the line from the colleges, because if you look at most colleges, their financial reports, they're highly leveraged with debt for capital uh, capital campaigns. And with a lot of these capital campaigns, if we have another, another bubble burst like in 08, a lot of these portfolios are going to go underwater. You're going to see the reduction in staff at the universities, and then these consolidations of these once bigger universities into a more state system, right? So when we start talking about, we know the revenue is coming in for these programs, but how much of that revenue can we rely on? Because the media rights is what, 821 million last year. So you take 821 million, it's going to continue to decrease because we have phones and that's how we get a lot of our information. How much of that revenue that NCAA is banking on and some of these member institutions are banking on will be here in five to 10 years to even educate the student body? Well, so the media rights, that's never going to go down. I used to say that. And as an old man here, I'll tell you, don't, don't, don't fall. I don't care what, you know, when they invented the TV, we thought it was going to go down. I mean, every, every new device, they say it's not, you know, you're not going to. So, so it's not going to be uh, that money's coming in is not going to be an issue. The thing you have to think about with any kind of college budget is it's all a matter of, of priorities and what the determination is. There's, there are very few units within a university where uh, uh, the, the president says, you have to make a profit. I mean, it really is a battle of what budget are you going to be allocated. And it's, it's, it's priority. So, so don't, don't think about, uh, I mean, the idea of, of money coming in, maybe it'll be a problem at some point, but that's not a problem. Now, it really is, uh, I mean, if you don't phrase it this way, it really is, OK, is it going to go to the English department or is it going to go to, to math? And, uh, and, and the whole idea of, of who's making what in, in athletics, that, that's kind of a red herring, too. It, it really is, what, what are we, what are we going to do here? What, what do we need to do? So, so that's more the way to think about it than to have the, the concern about whether or not revenues are going to go up and down. And uh, well, only 21 or 22 uh, D1 schools make a profit. All, uh, you know, that, that, it's all very, but, but you know, then pull money from the next time you get your $50 million gift, put it on. Uh, educating folks or something. And it's, the one example would be uh, Loyola. Sorry, that, that, <laughs> <laughs> Question during the reception. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Loyola Marymount so I'm sorry, I know that there's a lot to talk about, uh, and uh, with it, we're happy to continue that with the book signing and reception part of our program. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we look forward to seeing you next year at any and all of our programs. I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking uh, Colin and Ken for joining us this evening.